Welcome to lesson 2a, surface tension. In this lesson, we'll define and describe surface tension and contact angle. We'll do some example problems that involve surface tension. What is surface tension or the coefficient of surface tension? It's a measure of the force per unit length required to stretch the surface of a liquid. We give it the symbol sigma s. If this is the surface of a liquid and we stretch it with some force f, pulling it apart, the force per unit length into the page here required to stretch this surface is the surface tension. The dimensions of surface tension are thus force per length. Typical units are newtons per meter. An alternate explanation is that surface tension can be thought of as the surface energy, or work, per unit area required to stretch the liquid surface. In that case, the dimensions would be work, force times length, per unit area, L squared, which is the same as above, F over L. Of course, the units are also the same. In this case, the area would be the surface itself. In all cases, surface tension acts parallel to the liquid surface, as we sketched up here. There are many interesting consequences of surface tension. The first one we'll mention is that when a liquid is sprayed, it breaks into small spherical droplets, as you can see here. If this is one of those drops, the surface of the drop is under tension, like a balloon. And as we said, the direction of the surface tension is always parallel to the surface. The pressure inside the drop is greater than the pressure outside the drop. Again, think of the skin of a balloon, where the pressure inside is higher than the pressure outside. These drops are spherical, since a sphere represents the smallest surface area for a given volume. Another consequence is that this surface acts like a stretched film in tension, so objects heavier than the liquid can float, even a razor blade or a paper clip. Now we know that the density of steel is much bigger than that of water, yet if you set these objects gently on some water, they'll float. Again, that's because of surface tension. Another consequence is that liquids rise, or can fall in some cases, vertically in small diameter capillary tubes. In this picture, the larger radius tubes are on the left and the smaller radius tubes are on the right. This is just a reservoir of the dyed water. Notice the capillary rise height increases as the tube diameter decreases. We'll talk about this some more soon. If you zoom in on one of these tubes, you would find that the surface is not flat, but rather has a curve shape. This is called a meniscus. I have a short video called Surface Tension, It's a Bit of a Stretch. I'll show some clips from that video. What causes a pendant drop to cling to a tube without falling? That would be surface tension. What enables a water strider to walk on water? Surface tension. What allows a razor blade to float on water? Again, surface tension. A molecule right at the surface of a liquid experiences an unbalanced force from the molecules below it. To balance these forces, the liquid minimizes its surface area. The surface then acts like a thin elastic sheet that's stretched. This is why there's surface tension. Surface tension always acts parallel to the liquid surface. Here's a rig set up to measure surface tension. Here, surface tension acts on both the front and back surfaces. When you pull this wire, a force is required to stretch the two surfaces. We illustrate the forces here. And if you measure F and B, you can easily calculate sigma s. Yes, thanks, Professor Skeptic. A soap bubble is a great example of surface tension. The bubble acts like a stretched balloon. <laughs> Again, surface tension acts on both surfaces, this time the inner and the outer surface. The pressure inside the soap bubble is greater than the pressure outside because the film is stretched like a balloon. Surface tension forces and pressure forces must balance. You can easily solve for the pressure difference. 4 times sigma s divided by the radius of the bubble. And here are three takeaway equations. We're talking about a measurement rig, spherical droplets, and soap bubbles. Comparing these two, we see this factor of two difference. Why? First consider a drop or submerged bubble. So say a drop of water floating in the air or an air bubble in water. In either case, there's a radius r and there's only one surface. That surface is under tension. And when you work out the math, you get two sigma s over r as the pressure difference between inside and outside. Now consider a soap bubble. I'll exaggerate the thickness of the bubble. What we have is a thin film of soapy water. So this outer surface is exposed to air and it will have surface tension acting on it. The inner surface will also have surface tension. There's two surfaces. Since the film is so thin, the radius is almost the same for both. The two surfaces result in the factor of two. So for a soap bubble, 
pressure difference is 4 sigma s over r instead of 2 sigma s over r. Now let's talk about contact angle. We give it the symbol phi. It's an angle. The angle between the tangents to the liquid and solid surfaces at a point of contact. For a so-called wetting fluid, phi is less than 90 degrees and capillary liquid rises as illustrated here. Notice that the contact angle, as we defined up here, is less than 90 degrees. For a non-wetting fluid, phi is greater than 90 degrees, as would be the case for something like mercury. Notice that the meniscus is also upside down compared to the water case, the wetting fluid, where the meniscus is like this. I also drew a meniscus on the other side of the tube. If you don't have a tube, you still have like a half of meniscus here, and then it levels off. The upside down meniscus is also visible on the outside of the tube, as illustrated here. The capillary rise height is h. For a wetting fluid, H is positive. For a non-wetting fluid, H is negative. Let's consider, for example, water in a glass tube. For pure water, phi is nearly zero degrees. For tap water, phi is not zero, but depending on contaminants, it could be anywhere from, say, 10 to 20 degrees. Compared to mercury in a glass tube, phi is about 135 degrees, which is greater than 90. That's why we call mercury non-wetting, and that's why H is actually negative. I have another short video called Calculation of Capillary Rise in a Tube, where we go through the algebra to derive this capillary rise height equation. R is the radius of the tube. I'll show some clips from that video as well. But I made a short video about this, and I can show it now. Now we calculate the height as a function of the other variables. Surface tension acts circumferentially, so the total surface tension upward is sigma s times the circumference times cosine phi. W is the weight of the fluid. If we ignore the meniscus, W is rho g times the volume of the liquid inside here. That acts down. Since the liquid is stationary, Newton's law tells us that we can sum up the forces and set them to zero. Upward force must equal the downward force. Now we solve for H. H is 2 sigma s cosine phi over rho g r. We did this for a wetting fluid, but it also works for a non-wetting fluid. In that case, H would be negative. Let's demonstrate this equation experimentally. Since R is in the denominator, a smaller tube should yield a larger capillary rise for the same liquids. We see that this is true. The rise height is larger in the smaller diameter tube compared to the larger diameter tube. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. The diagrams with the force vectors really help me understand all this. We have a table that shows surface tension of some fluids in air at one atmosphere and 20 degrees C. Compare, for example, water at 20 degrees C and a soap solution at 20 degrees C. The surface tension of soapy water is about a third that of water. And that's part of the reason why you can wash things better with soap. Let's do a quick example capillary rise in a tube. A tube of radius 1.2 millimeters is inserted through the surface of pure water at 20 degrees C in one atmosphere. I'm going to change this to tap water. We want to calculate capillary rise height. We'll use sigma s from the table, 0.073 newton per meter. I'll convert h to meters. For the contact angle, I'll assume tap water with a phi of about 10 degrees. As I said previously, this value will vary depending on the impurities in the water. We also look up the density of water at 20 degrees, 998.0 kilogram per meter cubed. Now we have everything we need to plug into this equation. 2 times sigma s over the density, gravitational constant, and r, cosine phi. I'll multiply by a unity conversion factor. A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. This gives me 0 0.0122 meters. My final answer is h is 1.2 centimeters to two significant digits, which is about all we can hope for in this problem. Notice that all the dimensions cancel except these three, which turn out to be meters on the top, which is what we want. Finally, I have another short video called Why Do Coffee Rings Form? You've probably seen these on your kitchen counter. This is a consequence of surface tension, and we explain how that works in this video. When I drink coffee, I always spill some, and when the drops dry, they leave these rings all over, like these pictures here I done took. Hey, dude, I've seen that too, man. What about you, Ned? Well, I don't drink coffee. It makes me too nervous. Professor Skeptic, what causes this? Those are called coffee rings. I'll share a presentation I recently gave. When a drop of coffee evaporates, it forms a coffee ring, also called a coffee stain. Here are some examples. Why do these rings form? Coffee is a type of colloidal suspension. Microscopic particles are suspended in the water. When the water evaporates, 
coffee particles are left behind. If evaporation were uniform, no coffee rings would form. But it turns out that the evaporation rate is not uniform due to strong interaction between the liquid and microscopic surface roughness. On the surface, the contact line, or the rim, remains fixed throughout the evaporation process. Near this fixed contact line, liquid molecules can leave more readily, leading to a higher evaporation rate. The evaporation rate is thus fastest near these contact lines. Therefore, liquid and the particles in it must move radially outward to make up for the liquid lost by evaporation at this contact line. As the liquid evaporates, the drop flattens, and the particles collect near the rim. As illustrated in this animation, in the end we have a coffee ring. Here are some time-lapsed video clips of coffee rings as they form. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.